The video is the Dublin 2012 May Day March. Uh, in order that you don't get to hear all my inane chatter with people as I meet them, the audio that is recorded over it is a Rethinking Revolution discussion from last year, and it's one given by Paul Bowman on class. And uh, George is talking, mentions this, this little passage about categorization. It says, this passage quotes a certain Chinese encyclopedia in which it is written that animals are divided into A, belonging to the emperor, B, embalmed, e, tame, D, suckling pigs, E, mermaids, F, fabulous, G, stray dogs, H, included in pleasant classification, I, trembling as if mad, J, innumerable, K, drawn with a fine camel hair brush, L, etc., M, having just broken the water pitcher. N, that from a long way off looked like flies. And of course, it's it's a typical Borges, slightly surrealist inspired hoax. Um, but one of the nice things about it is it makes, you know, it's using the idea of Orientalism, you know, these, these strange, obscure Oriental mind, unscrutable, but really as a way of taking a piss out of ourselves. Mm -hmm in the sense of thinking, of course, our categorization schemes aren't like that at all. Ours are rational. So, like, well, how <coughs> rational are our categorization schemes, really? You know, are they that from things that from along the way, way look like flies? <coughs> so, speaking of which, we get to class. Um, I'll very briefly mention <coughs> some of the tools of thought that we kind of run into speaking about class. I'm not going to go into them too much because they're abstract at this, at this stage. There's kind of two different ways of thinking, um, which is like, you ever seen the, the uh, visual image of the two faces that look like a vase, depending on which way you look at it? There's a similar problem in, in how we think about things, particularly about objects and relations. Um, we tend historically to focus on objects, and then the relations are well, secondary, if you go. Um, the other way of looking at that is to focus on the relations, and then the objects themselves are secondary. So if you think about debtors and debt, you know, debtees. No, that's not right. Whatever the opposite of debt, debtor and creditors. Creditors, exactly. Um, do they exist prior to the relationship, or does a relationship sort of define them in a certain kind of way? You can't really have a creditor unless you have a debt, debtor at the other end of it. Um, so that's, that's a sort of relational focus way of looking at things rather than an objective way of looking at things. Um, and the other one is to do with issues that arise, issues out of composition, to do with emergencies and stuff. But we'll come back to these as we actually look at people's differing ideas of classes. So, um, we start in the 19th century with people talking about classes, plural. There are the upper classes, the lower classes, the middling classes, etc. Um, and it's gradually through the 19th century that people start to, to speak of class, singular, like upper class, lower class, and so on. But throughout the 19th century, everybody uses class. So no one actually in the 19th century ever really thinks to define class because why would you define a word or a term that everybody uses and everybody knows what it is? So from our point of view, the, the whole idea of like, is there such a thing as class really is something that only appears in the 20th century. Um, but so for a lot of the socialist movement, um, including you know Marx and Bakunin and the early anarchists and so on and so forth, don't really spend a lot of time defining class because it wouldn't occur to them to do that. You know, workers are workers, capitalists are capitalists. It's fairly straightforward. Um, but anyway, we're going to look at today's definitions of classes, and we'll start with the funny ones, which are the conventional um, definitions <coughs> that you find in use in marketing or the office of statistics in Ireland. Um, the first one we have is the good old A, B, C1, C2, D's, and E's. He's great. This actually came from, originally it was a readership survey. done, um, I think, in the States or somewhere. 
but uh, was picked up by the marketing industry. So you have at your very top of your, your A grade, you have upper middle class. A straight away begs the question, what's at the middle of? Um, B is middle class, C1, lower middle class, C2, skilled working class, D, working class, D, those at the lowest levels of subsistence. Um, and on the right hand column you've got, you know, chief income earner's occupation. So we can see it's based on income, it's based on occupation. And it's a categorization, you know, the idea is that basically you're going to categorize who's in what class. Um, so. Uh, the other one is a slightly more updated version of that, which is, you know, this is in official use in all of our statistical bodies, which is the NSSEC. And again, it is basically occupational so, um, and categorical. Now, so we move away from those into the sociological approaches. Uh, we start with Weber, um, and we start with stratification. Now, I don't know if you ever had a, a picture like this drawn when you was doing history in school about the, the feudal pyramid. You had your, your serfs and your slaves here at the bottom, and uh, free peasants. The feudal pyramid. Um, and it's a very clear thing, you know, kings on top of nobles, and they look down on clergy, you look down on people in towns, but it looks down on peasants, except, of course, the young free serfs peasants. Um, and it's a very clear vertical thing, you know, God is up here in his heaven, and the devil's down here in hell. And the further up you are in this thing, the nearer you are to God, and the further down here you are, the more the best you are near to hell you are. <coughs> the vertical model. So... <coughs> This is quite important because the vertical model is still very much with us today. There's people talk about the upper class and their lower class, upper middle, lower middle, etc. And Weber is good on this. He he basically says that um, he's with the whole strata level. You know, the class is basically an element. is social stratification set in layers. You have upper and down. Um, Nowhere has anyone, as far as I can find, ever justified this vertical metaphor. Why is one class up and the other class down? You know, it doesn't have to be a triangle. It could be a one. You know, it could be a weird network, something like that. There's no actual basis behind the strata model, the up and down, apart from the fact that we all have this historical memory that society looks like this pyramid. And you find anarchist versions of this as well. You can lose pictures of lots of other people and so on and so forth. Um, so, but Weber complicates matters. He says that, okay, the stratification itself is, is the basic thing, and he um, says that there are sort of more class divisions He's, he's basically reacting to Marx, more class of than Marx talked about, and that you have differences in different spheres. So you have class, status, and party, which stratify society. Um, and his main divisions were uh, four main classes the upper class, white collar workers, um, the petite bourgeoisie, and the manual workers. Um, Da, da, da. And again, we have three independent factors. We've got class, which is a person's economic position, status, which is someone's individual status. They could be famous. They could be famous for being on reality TV, whatever. Um, and power, um, which could become from holding office within a state institution or something like that. Um, the only notes I've made here is that you start to get towards this idea of class being simply one sort of form of stratification or hierarchization uh, amongst many, which ties into um, what in the U.S. became theory of triple oppression is now intersectionality and all that jazz. 
Um, I haven't done that much on the rest of sociology because sociology is really not my field. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to run through Marxist theories of class, which is unfortunately a bit longer than Atticus theories of class, mainly because Atticus theories of class, as I say, we started in the 19th century when you didn't have to talk about and we didn't have done so hot in the 20th century about coming up with theories on those things. But anyhow, Marx himself, of course, didn't actually write anything on class. Not directly. It was part of, he initially had this huge six-volume schema that he was going to write about capital, land, labor, international trade, the state, and class. He actually only got around to capital. Um, the only thing he really does say, and it's sort of almost said in passing, which is why a lot of people missed it initially, is that class is a social relation. It's not a thing. Um, anyway, he dies, Engels carries on, and together builds the Social Democratic Party uh, with various people in Germany. They built the Social Democratic Party in Germany after Engels' death. Um, the Pope of Marxism, if you like, is a chap called Karl Kautsky. And from Kautsky, journal Social Doc Democracy and so on, you get something called Orthodox Marxism. Um, and there's some characteristics of Orthodox Marxism here, which I shall go into, because they, um, they apply equally pretty much to um, Kautsky and also to Leninism and most of everything that comes out of that. So its basic ideas are they have a strong version of the theory that the economic base determines the cultural and political superstructure. They claim that Marxism is a science. Um, and the idea of false consciousness. Um, and the problem with false consciousness is it comes out of something that Marx said, although Marx never talked about false consciousness. Marx said something about the, the theory of fetishism of commodities, the way that the market makes things appear to us as if they're divorced from the people that make them and the implications that have. But in Orthodox Marxism, this becomes something entirely different. Um, and the best way of going through that is this little quote from Kautsky that Lenin quotes in um, What is to be Done. <clears throat> in a draft program, it stated, the more capitalist development increases the numbers of the proletariat, the more the proletariat is compelled and becomes fit to fight against capitalism. The proletariat becomes conscious of the possibility and the necessity of socialism. In this connection, socialist consciousness appears to be a necessary and direct result of the proletarian class struggle. But this is absolutely untrue. Of course, socialism as a doctrine has its roots in modern economic relations, just as class struggle the proletariat has, and like the letter emerges from struggles against capitalist credit poverty and misery of the masses, but socialism and the class struggle arise side by side and not one out of the other. Each arises under different conditions. Modern socialist consciousness can arise only on the basis of profound scientific knowledge. Indeed, modern economic science is much conditioned for socialist production as, say, modern technology, and a proletariat can create neither the one nor the other, no matter how much it may desire to do so. Both arise out of the modern social process. The vehicle of science is not the proletariat, but the bourgeois intelligentsia. It was in the minds of individual members of the stratum that modern socialism originated, and it was they who communicated it to the more intellectually developed proletarians in the term introduced in into the proletarian class <coughs> conditions. So that's, done. that's to be done. Thus, socialist consciousness is something introduced into the proletarian class from without, and not something that arose within it spontaneously. Da, da, da. So, false consciousness here becomes basically the working class people are never going to figure out socialism by themselves. So you need scientific intellectual specialists who will go away, study the great scientific volumes of Marxism, and will come down with tablets on the stone from on high and provide the necessary consciousness. Um, and Lenin actually follows this in what is to be done with an even more chilling paragraph, which he says, so of course the idea, he's, he's arguing against these people who are basically arguing in terms of sort of a syndicalist approach. He said, the basic idea, anybody who's arguing from the basis of class struggle is objectively um, talking about bourgeois ideology because there are only two ideologies. One of them is socialist, which is the scientific Marxist one, which only we have. And anything that is not that ideology is bourgeois ideology because there's only two ideologies. Right. And the actual 
the implications of that is basically that if me and Andrew have a disagreement about a political matter, you know, within an anarchist circle, it's two people having a disagreement. Within the Leninist framework, if I'm Lenin, Andrew's not only wrong, Andrew's position is bourgeois. You know, his whole argument is an argument of the enemy. He's an objectively a member of the enemy by disagreeing with me, de facto. Um, so this, this whole, this sort of, this unholy trinity of orthodox Marxism, of Marxism, Marxism as this infallible science that somehow has access to knowledge in a way that the rest of us don't. Um, and false consciousness means our actual ordinary experiences of class struggle, etc., and everything that we learn under struggle is somehow wrong. Um, these, you know, basically creates what we know as the source of Marxism. Um, now then, the new left um, is in England was people who left the Communist Party after um, Hungary '56 um, for fairly obvious reasons, and they attempted to look for a route out of the dead end of, of Stalinism. Now, the following quote I'm going to make is from E.P. Thompson's um, Making the English Working Class, and you can see here how he's moved away from a most of the positions of orthodox Marxism. By class, I understand an historical phenomenon unifying a number of disparate and seemingly unconnected events, both in the raw material of experience and in consciousness. I emphasize that it is an historical phenomenon. I do not see class as a structure, nor even as a category, but as something which in fact happens and can be shown to have happened in human relationships. More than this, the notion of class entails the notion of historical relationship. Like any other relationship, it is a fluency which evades analysis if we attempt to stop it dead at any given moment and anatomize its structure. The finest mesh sociological net cannot give us a pure specimen of class any more than it can give us one of deference or of love. The relationship must always be embodied in real people and in a real context. Moreover, we cannot have two distinct classes, each with an independent being, and then bring them into relationship with each other. We cannot have love without lovers, nor deference without squires and laborers. And class happens when some men, as you can tell this written in the 50s, as a result of common experiences inherited or shared, feel and articulate the identity of their interests as between themselves and against other men whose interests are different from and usually opposed to theirs. The class experience is largely determined by the productive relations into which men are born or enter involuntarily. Class consciousness is, in, is the way in which these experiences are handled in cultural terms, embodied in traditions, value systems, ideas, and institutional forms. If the experience appears as determined, class consciousness does not. We can see a logic in the responses of similar occupational groups undergoing similar experiences, but we cannot predicate any law. Consciousness of class arises in the same way in different times and places, but never in just the same way. There is today an ever-present temptation to suppose that class is a thing. This was not Marx's meaning in his own historical writing, yet the error vitiates much latter-day Marxist writing. It, the working class, is assumed to have a real existence, which can be defined almost mathematically. So many men who stand in a certain relation to the means of production. Once this is assumed, it becomes possible to deduce the class consciousness which it ought to have, but seldom does have, if it was properly aware of its own position and real interests. There is a cultural superstructure through which this recognition dawns in inefficient ways. These cultural lags and distortions are a nuisance, so it is easy to pass from this to some theory of substitution. The party, sect, or theorist who disclose class consciousness not as it is, but as it ought to be. Um, and I'll skip the next paragraph and just say, if we remember the class as a relationship and not a thing, we cannot think this way. It does not exist. Either to have an ideal interest or consciousness, or to lie as a patient on the adjuster's table. Nor can we turn matters on their heads to be done by one authority. Blah, 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 blah. 
Um, and finally, again, these are stark questions. If we stop history at a given point, there are no classes. We're simply a multitude of individuals and a multitude of experiences. Da, da, da. But if we watch these men over an adequate period of social change, we observe patterns in the relationships, their ideas, and their institutions. Class is defined by men as they live their own history, and in the end, this is its only definition. Right, so you, we've got a complete rejection of the orthodox Kowski Leninist approach there. And going back to some of those abstract philosophical things I mentioned at the start, we're moving here from a class as a thing perspective to the class as a relation perspective, and also a relation that by definition has to occur through time. So it has to be part of the process of change. So, um, moving on from E.P. Thompson and the, the 50s and 60s, around the time of the late 60s, we, we've got a sort of coming together of uh, a whole mess of sort of <coughs> leftist type stuff. This is people who are to the left of the Communist Party in the 50s and 60s. Um, on the one hand, you have Trotsky's theory of, you know, or his attempt to explain what went wrong in Russia, which was that basically due to underdevelopment, a bureaucratic caste took over, and it's this caste that <coughs> sort of enslaved the proletariat there, blah, blah. Um, now, it's not far from there to see how people who drift out of the Trotskyist movement go, well, why is it a caste? Why isn't it a new class? Uh, and you have this whole sort of family of, of sort of theorists who start to think as well the, the nomenclatura in, in Russia are in fact a new exploitive class. They're extracting surplus value, surplus labor from the workers directly. This messes together with a whole bunch of stuff from the German Council of Communists, etc. The end result is and this sort of comes out in the late 60s, and uh, Danny Cohen Bendit's book of 68, whose title I forget, is, is a good sort of summary of this theory. It's sort of a merger of a, some ideas from counter communism, some from anarcho syndicalism, and some from people like Castoriadis, etc., as Trotsky. This idea that self management is a thing. You know, the, the, whole, the whole problem is basically that there's, a, there's this class of functionaries out there waiting to seize control. Uh, and exploit us through the mechanism of the state. Therefore, radical horizontalism, self-management, is the way to resist this thing. So um, the, the term in French, autogestionnel, is actually invented by um, um, Fontenis, in fact. So it's, an, it's an actually an anarchist term that was taken up by the Council of Communists and left us today. Um, and one of the descendants of this sort of evolution is um, the Paracon theory of the coordinator class, which is still with us. Um, so I've got a quotation down there from Paracon, what is class? Um, I'm not going to read you the whole thing. Um, it basically starts off, classes, a group of people, similar material interests, blah, blah, blah. Um, they and say, well, it's not just the ownership of the means of production, it's actually the role that you play. So again, it's an occupational thing, and it's based around monopolizing knowledge as a factor of production. Um, autonomia. Hmm. Autonomia, again, they uh, really, the, the relation to class, the most interesting thing um, was probably not from autonomia, it's actually from the predecessor which is operaismo, which means workerism, um, which is this idea of class composition. Um, now, as usual with anything from the Italians, it's very difficult to get a clear, <laughs> readable definition that doesn't have shitloads of difficult language in it. Um, I've tried to pick out a few quotes there. But basically, the idea of class composition, again, is, is coming from Marx's use, differentiation between the technical process of production and the relations of production. So they talk about the technical class composition and the political composition. The technical composition is basically how many people are doing what kind of work, if you like, um, and how they're doing it. You know, who who is shoveling shit towards who is loading it on the trucks and 
he was rearing children, he was teaching people, and so on. What is the, the society-wide division of labor? How does that work? The technical process. Because obviously this changes over time. Um, and then they say the political composition is that, is, is the extent to which people in these old different sort of roles within the technical composition um, relate to each other and how they see themselves and how they see themselves in relation to the other people in the other roles. And that's the political composition. Their idea is um, that as the working classes politically recompose themselves to start recreating solidarity amongst all the different people, they are, because solidarity between people who are exactly the same as you is not actually solidarity. That's just looking out for yourself and your mates. The whole concept of solidarity is that you're supposed to be um, practicing mutual aid between people who are different than you, but you recognize that you have something in common, which is your class position, if nothing else. Um, so they have this idea that as political recomposition happens, the um, capitalists then try and change the technical the technical mode of production, technical composition, in order to, to undo, to defuse that political recomposition. And the main thing was they wanted to get to was that the Communist Party at the time had a very strong pro-technology position. You know, we are for the development of the forces of production, because um, capitalism will develop the force of production until that glorious day when we, the PCI, will take over and dish out largesse to all. Until that time, the role of the working class is simply to suffer and to vote for the communists. Um, whereas the opera East was going, no, the technology that is being introduced on the production lines is not neutral. It is against us. It is being used to break down our power. Wherever we find a way of a, a, a trying to grab power over the production process, that's where they bring in the new technology to break down our power. So technology is not a neutral thing. It's part of the class struggle. Um, anyway, yak, 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 and yak on for hours about the autonomous, but getting back to the class thing, again, they're trying to escape from the orthodox idea of class um, by re-examining the relationship between um, class and class consciousness. Um, and there's a little quote from, that Nate actually put up on his blog, from uh, Cassandra. Um, saying the category of class composition in the tradition of operaismo has always been at the same time analytic and political. Um, Sandra notes that in the center of the operaismo class composition replaces the idea of class consciousness. It could be said that the relation between the technical composition and political composition of the class replaces in a way the traditional relation between class in itself and class for itself. That is the relation within which classical Marxism opens the space for class consciousness and the party as, as a separate subject. In this sense, it seems to me that operaismo produced a very important innovation with Marxism. So, and he goes on to say a few things. Now, there's, there's, there's a, a left wing and a right wing way of, of looking at this. <coughs> People like Negrin, sort of the, the right autonomous, say basically that the idea of class composition meant that. You know, back in the day of the late 19th century, early 20th century, in places like Russia where you had like a small labor aristocracy of professional workers and a mass of unskilled workers, then the Leninist party is the organizational form that actually corresponds to the te that technical composition of class. And that now that we have the mass worker of the 60s and 70s, obviously we need a new organizational form. So it's like, Leninism will be wrong now, but it was okay then. Um, obviously, people from a more left-wing tradition say, no, Leninism was always fucking wrong. But that's another story. So, finally coming to the anarchists. As I've already mentioned, in the 19th century, there wasn't a whole lot of attempts to define class because um, it was common language and, and people didn't think to define it. Now, the excerpt I have is actually from a debate at the 1907 Amsterdam Conference which uh, Nestor has kindly translated for us and is available through the FDHR. Uh, and it's a debate, a conversation between Malatesta and a guy called Pierre Monat, who's a French syndicalist from the CNT, um, and sort of fresh from having won the, the Charter of Amiens. And Monat has just been arguing a position that, um, you know, syndicalism is the way forward that anarchists lost themselves in the wilderness with all their mad insurrectional shit back in the 1870s and 1880s, 
now through syndicalism, we're getting back in touch with the working class, and in fact, with revolutionary syndicalism, um, like the Wobblies, the CNT in France, and so on and so forth, that is actually all the anarchist goals are in fact encompassed within the syndicalist movement, so we should simply dissolve ourselves into that movement. Um, and Maltese says, no! Uh, which is interesting, Maltese was actually key in, in the spread of syndicalism because he was in London at the time following the London Dock Strike of 1889 when Tom Mann and all those people were getting the new unions together. He communicates the new unions, people like uh, Emile Pouget, uh, Pelletier, and uh, Pateau, and they, from there, syndicalism spreads. Anyway, Malatesta. The basic error of Monat and all revolutionary syndicalists is, my in my opinion, derives from an overly simplistic conception of the class struggle. It is a conception whereby the economic interests of all workers of the working class are held to be equal, whereby it is enough for workers to set about defending their own particular interests in order for the interests of the whole proletariat against the boss to be defended. The reality is very different in my view. The workers like the bourgeoisie, like everyone, are subject to the law of universal competition that derives from the system of private property and that will only be extinguished together with that system. There are therefore no classes in the proper sense of the term because there are no class interests. There exists competition and struggle within the working class just as there does among the bourgeoisie. The economic interests of one category of worker are implacably in contrast with those of another category. And indeed, we sometimes see some workers much closer economically, mentally, to the bourgeoisie than to the proletariat. <coughs> Cornelissen gave us some examples of this fact here in Holland, and there are others. I need not remind you the workers very often use violence during their strikes against police or bosses. No, against the scabs, who too are excluded and even more unfortunate. While the workers' true enemies, the only real obstacle to social equality are the police and, police and the bosses. So, again, um, saying something, you know, 50 years before um, Edward Thompson, saying something similar, which is this statement, it does not exist. There are no classes if you think that class is a thing which has an, ob an objective interest. It's not that simple. Um, and Malatesta goes on to talk about that, of course, he is syndicalist and he's in favor <coughs> of anarchists using syndicalism to promote work class self activity and so on. But that there will always be a need for a specifically political anarchist <coughs> organizational movement um, to hold forth the idea of solidarity and to, you know, sort of to continue to push for the creation of solidarity against the, the problems of real material interests that can divide workers, if you see what I mean. Um, so that's more of a compositional thing, whereas, whereas what Thompson was talking about was more of a process thing, if you like, that you can, if you take a snapshot in time, you can't see class, that you can only see it develop as a process. Um, with uh, Malatesta, because he is these he, conventional uh, Sorry, because he is a libertarian communist, um, which has a deeper knowledge of communism, if you like, than Marxism. <coughs> He's saying it's a compositional problem as well. It's this idea that somehow the working class is naturally united um, does not hold up to scrutiny. That's a political achievement. The unity of the working class is a political achievement. It doesn't simply come about naturally. Um, so... Getting back, the final concluding remarks was um, I asked the questions at the beginning is class as a thing, a group, an identity? Um, you know, a lot of people talk about working class culture. Um, they quite often mean white male working class culture, but they talk about working class culture as, as if it exists and if it defines what it means to be working class. <coughs> is it a strata following Weber? Or is it a relation or a process? Um, I'm sure you probably no doubt from the selection of materials that I've made, see which side I'm coming down on this. But of course, that doesn't mean I'm right. It's just <clears throat> I have to tell you, you know, we have to start somewhere. So I'm going to start with what I think about it. Um, <coughs> the sort of metaphor 
I would go with, because a lot of people go with the, well, you know, how can there be a class if, you know, what, what about this person? They, they keep sort of picking positions of people you can't really say what side they're on, you know, as if class is a category. So when, you know, if you're looking for faults in a categorization system, <coughs> things that tremble as if they were mad or have just broken, broken the water picture. Um, you look at things that don't fit in with categorization systems. Say, hey, your categorization system is broken because I have all these examples that don't fit. Um, so I sort of like to use a, a, a crappy war analogy, I suppose, which is this idea that you know you have two different types of wars, if you like. You have the, the, the Waterloo, Napoleonic war. You have all these people in nice uniforms on one side and all these people in nice uniforms on the other side, and they make a horrible mess of each other. But you can tell more or less who's on what side depending on the color of the jacket they're wearing. The other option is somewhere like the Afghan war, where everybody dresses pretty much the same, has pretty much the same weapons, um, and also are mostly following around their war band leaders. And it's not entirely clear half the time which side these guys are actually fucking on. But just because it's hard to say which particular war band, which side they're fighting for at the moment, doesn't mean that there isn't actually a war on. And that for me is, is the thing about class, is that it's, it's this relation of struggle that really is determinative, that creates a class. Just because there are people that may stay out on the strike line or strike, you know, stay out for nine months and then on the tenth month be forced back to work to scab. You know, they still fought the war just because they became scabs like a week before the strike folded or whatever still means people and speak to them in communities. But it didn't mean that for all that time they didn't fight <coughs> the war. So it's, it's the actual struggle, the relationship of struggle that is constituted for me, rather than just simply having boxes to put people in and say that, you know, people are staying in this box forever until they die or something like that. Okay, I'll stop there. Questions? Discussion. That's the end of the audio track from the Rethinking Revolution meeting. That was a talk on class by Paul Bowman. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you'll find more audio and video at the WSM site at www.wsm.ie. Uh, we also have more video like this in our Facebook account if you do a search on Facebook for Workers' Solidarity Movement, you'll find us there.